So hallelujah. Good stuff. God is so good. Amen? Amen. All right. So are you ready for some word? Yeah. All right. So we'll get this all brought in. Um, God, God is so good. Let me make sure I get my notes in the right place. So Patty, we're going to start off watching a little clip from some friends of mine from Denver, Colorado, Colorado Nina and Jeff Corson. Uh, we had our, you know, we, normally we go down to L.A. for that gathering, international gathering with John Master Giovanni and about, oh, 10 or 12 other people from like Germany, England, South Africa and everything else. Well, Jeff and Nina are some friends of ours that have, we met in this group. And this week we had our little thing. We didn't go down. We, we zoomed in. But uh, there's a lot of neat stuff when I started hearing what's happening in Africa and Germany and England and Canada. I'm like, hmm. We're right in the same boat, all of us. So if you'd play that, Patty, this is Jeff and Nina Corson, some good friends of ours. Oh, oh, we're stalling for time. Okay, we're stalling for time. She gives me one of these. Remember that? You never seen this? Stretch, stretch it out, stretch it out. Yes, I am. Yes. So what was really cool is uh, Friday, I think it was Friday, we were having our Zoom meeting. And if you all saw that there was some earthquakes that happened in Hawaii and Los Angeles yeah. at 2 o'clock, there was a great, there was a shaking. It wasn't a great shaking in uh, where John and Karen and all the guys were at, but it was a shaking in the house. I thought that was kind of interesting, two o'clock. And I was on the Zoom call at the time. <laughs> so it was, it was just pretty cool. And uh, so it was neat to talk to uh, Gareth Duffy and his wife. Uh, they're from Nettle Hill in the United Kingdom. And they're closing their ministry there. And they're moving down to where Francois is in South Africa. Yes, they are. Oh, I'm telling you, there's a lot of movement in the body right now, at least in the circle that we run in. So I don't know what that means for us. I'm just sitting back and watching what the Lord's doing. And then uh, my friends Mike and Robin from Canada, uh, they're in a really neat place. They have, uh, they, they drove from uh, Carpoose or someplace like that, it's, and they drove all the way to, down to L.A. It took them 23 hours. And uh, they were having a good time down there. And next year, we'll probably be going to Canada instead of L.A. because um, they're going to host it next year. So there's some, a lot of neat stuff happening there. And then, let's see, Jeff and Nina, they're, they're, they're uh, in transition. And then John, and Mas uh, John Master Giovanni and Karen, they've had this church down in, uh, in California near L.A. And uh, they've had this building. And it's a, it's a big old building. And they have been ha trying to get sell it. Well... It's been a while. And this last week, some things came together. They're selling their church building. It's going to become a multifamily complex. And they'll be doing basically almost all Zoom church services from L.A. now. So I'm sitting there going, okay, there's a lot of stuff happening with these leaders that we're a part of. And uh, they're selling their building, and they're going to be doing a Zoom church, kind of like what we do but it'll be almost primarily for that and just local people gathering together. So I'm just going, okay, a God. And it's really interesting. In the conversation, uh, talking with, uh, listening in and talking, they, they share something. It's very interesting. You know, the church is supposed to be on the cutting edge. We're 10 years behind what the world's doing, what society is doing. It's real obvious. And uh, so in the conversation, we're like, so... If we're 10 years behind, what happened 10 years ago? What has society started doing? And it really has its, this big shift to live feeding Zoom and interaction like that. And it, and it was COVID was the, was the test run for this. And the, most of the church said, okay, we can do that. But they didn't make the shift. And what's interesting is just watching how God's taking and removing things so that the church kind of goes, oh, you know what? Maybe we need to invest more into this. So I'm just kind of watching how this is playing out. And we're already there. I mean, we're running. Just as many people here are online watching on Zoom all over the place, all over the, all over the world. So I'm like, okay, Lord. So we're right where we're supposed to be. Some of the, we had uh, some words given to us on Friday. There's a, we spent like four or five hours. We all pray over each other and get words and things like that. And, uh, Several of the people that I, that I personally know that are very on the cutting edge confirmed a lot of the stuff that we're doing right now. And uh, 
the, uh, Mike from, and Robin from Canada spoke into our lives, John Master Giovanni, and then some of the other leaders from around the world going, yeah, da, 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 da. So we're going to, we have to wait to get that video of that so we can transcribe it all down to, to just, you know, you, you start pulling things apart. So Patty, are we good? Did you give me a thumbs up yet? Okay. All right. Okay, I'll stand still. Okay. Can we get somebody prettier than me? <laughs> okay, all right. So we can listen then? Is that how we're going to do it? Okay, you'll be able to hear Jeff. And, and it's what they say is important. I will stand still. Dum, 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 dum. <gasps> okay, yeah. One moment, please. Technical difficulties. Yes. No. Our fingers. Yeah. So we thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, getting along with people who aren't like you or who aren't like me. You know, over the years, I know I have found that, uh, well, let's put it this way. Recently, I have realized just how judgmental I've been over the years. I mean, we've been uh, following Christ for you longer than me, but me about 45 years, <clears throat> that's a long time, and just to recently realized that
into the church and it just shut me down. I, I didn't even know what to say next. Now this was judgmental Nina, right? So, I mean, I was kind to them and I was loving, but I really didn't have a clue what to say next. Well, what I've, of course, first of all, I don't even have those strong of feelings anymore because I'm learning to be less judgmental. But if I do, the, the what I should have said is, oh, well, tell me about that church. What did you like about it? Yeah. Tell me, tell me why, you know, maybe, you know, but the point is, is enjoy them and think and listen to why they thought it was a great place to go to church. Obviously they were now changing, but whether, whether that's even the case or not, you're at a party and they're no, and not even thinking about going to another church, but you find out they're a different belief system. Well, tell me what you like about that. Tell me what that means to you. We, we need to listen without conclusions. We need to be willing to listen to people just as other humans and not bring conclusions to that. It's not important to conclude anything, but to value what they're saying just yes. because they're saying it and because they're human. Here's another point. Approach conversation with humility. Now, Nina already mentioned this, but listen to this. Philippians chapter two, verse three and four. In humility, value others above yourself, mm. not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So inquire about their interests and, and in doing so also display approbation. Absolutely. Respect them. Respect their right to believe whatever they believe. You know, God, if you read in Romans 14, <laughs> Talks, he, it talks about God being the God of all of us. And so one might believe this and one might believe that, but we're doing, each one doing what we think is best. And, and we just need to walk with each other. You know, that's what God is doing. He's walking with every human being, mm -hmm. no matter where they are and whether they recognize him yet or not. Yeah, that's really good. Well, so everybody, this is uh, the word for today or the sharing that we we're asked to bring. And again, we're Jeff and Nina from Denver, Colorado in the States. And uh, we pastor a church called Genesis, Genesis Gathering. Mm -hmm. And uh, boy, have we deconstructed for, from so many of the things that we are encouraging you about today, where we used to be on the very judgmental and not accepting and not inclusive side of things. And so we want to encourage you today, every person you meet, has unsurpassable worth to the Father. Mm -hmm. Amen. Aren't they cool people? Yeah, they're cool people. Like I said, they're uh, they're great friends. Uh, we've we met them, man, many years ago. I think I went down by myself and first met them down at, with John and Master Giovanni and Karen and Olen, and uh, you know, very similar hearts. Their 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 story is really pretty amazing. Watching how they've transitioned, um, so. Just wanted to listen to that. It, and you, what have you heard me say? Ask questions. Get in the conversation. Okay, that is, that's really the easiest way. Because humility is very forgiving. But when you come in with your agenda and you say, you know, you have this uh, the ego problem where I know I'm right and they're all wrong. Ooh, man. We've all been there. I know I was there for a good while and I'm still, you know, that's still being worked in me. So I wanted to start off this morning with that just to kind of set a tone, just a tone, a sound in this house, and for those that are watching as well. And as I said, uh, today's, if you need a title, I'm not into titles, but if you need a title for today's message, it's From Nicodemus to Flipping Tables. So there you go. I'm going to start with that. Um, so let's, if you have your Bibles, I do encourage people to take notes. Um, this is going to continue in the perspective adjustment that we've been talking about. Marcus, uh, as you know, I've been talking to him outside of this. He actually says it's a paradigm shift. If you're interested in studying out what that really means, a, a paradigm is, is, is something that's pretty well basic, strong. Uh, he would be far better at giving me the description of that. But it's when you have something you solidly have, and all of a sudden God goes, oh, by the way, you've heard it said, but I say. And he shifts everything on you. You go, whoa, what's that about? How did that happen? Where did that come from? That's not on my radar. So today we're going to go from Nicodemus to flipping tables. Because that is always 
listening and watching. So let's go ahead and we'll start off at John 3.3. 3. Let's see. Who's, can, are you, can you read okay? Okay, I'm going to have uh, Brandon read for me today. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. No, of God. Oh, there you go. Yep. There it is. Dun, dun, dun. She saved the best part for last. Okay. Now that's the New American Standard Bible. All right. Now, Patty, if you would bring up the mirror, if, uh, if you have that, because you know we like the mirror here. Yes. Jesus answered him emphatically, no one would even be able to recognize anything as coming from God's domain unless they are born from above to begin with. The very fact that it is possible to perceive that I am in union with God as a human being reveals mankind's genesis from above. Okay, so there's a, a huge difference. See, that's why I like the mirror. There's so many other translations out there. Uh, I like the, uh, the New Testament from ben, Bentley Hart. Is it John Bentley Hart? David, David. There you go. Okay, I like that one. But I really wanted to key off, of the, off the mirror on this because this is really... Um, the more I study other reflections of translation, I, I'm going to throw something out there. When I was uh, down with David and Melissa, Patty and I were there in, in uh, Idaho Falls, and one of their friends who was in the Mormon religion was sitting there. We were just talking. Uh, you know me, I asked questions, just like John and, you know, uh, Jeff and Nina said, just ask questions, get the conversation going. And what was interesting of how the Mormons look at us is they say, you have like 400 different translations of the Bible. We've got one. See, that is one of the things that they will harpoon us with. I get it. I'm not going to argue the point whether one way or another. But see, this is where we, having different translations, is really important to be able to kind of sift through them and see what was added to the King James. You all know that. We know the story about the lady caught in adultery. And Jesus says, who are your accusers? Neither do I accuse you. That's all he said. You go to the footnotes, what does it say? Go and sin no more. Where did that come from? When King James Version was written. It was written and added to the Bible. What does it say? Don't add to this, Don't add to this book. Well, there's a whole lot that's been added. Just leaving that sitting on the floor for everybody to walk past. Just want you to think about these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, and I like that. Some versions, if you go through the, the, new, the other one, it says, amen, amen. Amen and amen. No one would ever even be able to recognize anything as coming from God's dominion unless they are born from above to begin with. That is the beginning. That is the place of, of birth. That is the genesis of being able to see the kingdom of God. I don't even want to go into it, you know, getting and living in this kingdom of God. He's just, Jesus is laying it out for Nicodemus just so you can see the kingdom of God. You've got to recognize you're born from above, not here. Your whole perspective must be adjusted. That's the word. I, I love that. That's such a beautiful picture. It's like, remember, what do I, how do I present this? It's about like going to the chiropractor when you're out of place. Kirk knows that. Oh, my back. Okay? We're walking a little crookedy. All right? And then God adjusts us chiropractically kind of in the spirit realm so we can see properly. It's just And sometimes, you know, I, I had a, my back go out one time. I got hurt really bad at work. It took like six weeks because I was so bound up. And I had to just take little pieces at a time. It was like playing Jenga, okay? You got to take these little pieces out. And it took me a while before I could stand up. I was like walking around like this. You know, it took a while for that chiropractic adjustment to get all them knotted up muscles to get fixed so I could stand upright again. God's all about what? Walking uprightly. What does he say? Be holy as I am holy. Is that some goal I need to be? No, he's, it's like in the beginning there was. He spoke this, all of this into existence. When he said, be holy as I am holy, he is speaking the reality of where we live. Be holy. Stop thinking the old way. You're a new creature in, cre in Jesus Christ. All right, and this is really cool, being able to see from above. Nicodemus, this is verse 9. Uh, Nicodemus responded and said to him, How can these things be? 
And Jesus answered him, You are a teacher of Israel, yet you do not understand these things? I mean, Jesus, I mean, I'm sure Nicodemus, in his robes, standing uprightly with all his self appointed ideas that he had been raised in, in the Sanhedrin, being a good Pharisee, he knew what he knew. And Jesus is going, you're, 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 you're this? You should know better, basically, in my opinion. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you people do not accept our testimony. Oh, man. I want to really highlight that one point. We speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen. Knowing and seeing. Those are, that's experience. Knowing is where you, give inf- you get information first to start. And then because of our experiences, God reinforces what he has spoken into your life. And then you go, I know this is true. You live on this pl- new firm foundation. It is the rock of your, fa- of your faith. It's Christ because Christ is the living word. It's not some book. We know that books can be very weak in so many areas. See, a lot of people, say, they have a picture that, uh, of, the, of the birth of Christ. There's a, and it's a really funny picture. You see this little, you know, the, the manger picture? And instead of a baby, there's the book, the, the Bible sitting open. Yeah, that's, that's the word of God. That's what we live by. And while well, there was a baby there, but we're putting a book in this place. Go ahead. That's right. They say it's set in stone. It doesn't. That's right. Babies grow and they live and they thrive. You got some cold, dead letter of the law? It doesn't work too well. So, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you people do not accept our testimony. This is Jesus. It's like, you know what? You, you get it. You've got to be up here living from above. You're born from above. And Nicodemus is like, well, how do you get born? How can I go back in my mother's womb? And he's and like, oh, my goodness. Okay, how do I go through this? How do I get? You know, I'm sure Jesus is sitting there going, Holy Spirit, help me out here. I need, to, I need a little wisdom on how to speak to Nicodemus because he's, he's still seeing it like this. It's the literal. It's so hard when I, I get around people that look at the Bible literally and they see no difference deeper than just the surface. I'm going to take you for a walk in a minute to flipping tables, and we're going to look on it a little bit deeper than just the surface. If I told you earthly things and you did not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? See, they, he was telling me, you can't even see the kingdom things. How am I going to tell you about them? Because your, your belief system's here. It's literal. You can't see beyond that. All right, Patty, if you'd bring up that John uh, 3.11 in the Mirror Bible. I'm going to have Brandon. Oh, Brandon's on a walk. It's okay. Don't don't need to hurry. I want him to read that John 3.11. Yeah, I was grabbing some peanuts. It's it's all good, man. Chew them up good. Don't choke. I don't want you choking. It's like don't talk and breathe at the same time when you're chewing. Nicodemus, hear me. <clears throat> amen, amen. Our conversation stems from what we, mankind, have always borne witness to. We endorse what we have observed. Yes. How is it that your religious perspectives keep you so blinded to this? Bam! Bam! Say bam! bam. Religious perspectives. There's that word again. Oh, man. I'm, I'm, I was like, my hair was standing on him when I got this this morning. I said, this, I, you know. It's like, oh my gosh, you're really, you're speaking right into the midst of where I'm at. Our religious perspectives keep you, what? Blind. What does it, what does Paul say about the veil that is over our eyes? When we're looking at, we see the law and it's a veil to what life is meant to be. That old veil is removed. Poor Nicodemus sitting there going, I can't see what you're talking about. And Jesus is like, of course you can't see the kingdom because the veil's there. Okay? Just wanted to punch that through. Now, you know, you, you, you know we've been, you've been around me long enough. 
And you know the experiences I've had, and I, and I come through where the living word, remember this, the matrix that I talk about being inside of, all the scriptures, that are they're, they're all connected by these silver threads. And the living word makes the written word make sense. And this is the statement that I wrote in my, in my notes. Christ is the living matrix to live from. I know in my early days, I tried to use that, that paper book to make sense. And I was told, well, you read John. It's a love letter to the, to the world. I went, okay. Read John. I went, I could pull out some things that God loved the world, send his son. Son wasn't here to judge the world. But other than that, I'm not getting, I'm not feeling and experiencing it here. Because there was a veil. My religious perspectives were blinding me. So let's go over to Mark, and I'm going to start tearing this apart. I wanted to set the stage for where we all are, every one of us. None of us can say we are religious, perspective-free. I, I can't. I've been, I mean, phew. I know better than, the, as, as Jeff would say, or Nita would say, that I'm right and everybody else is wrong. No, this is my journey. This is this house's journey. You all's journeys is individual. Does that make every other church wrong? No, it makes them all right. Why? Because they're on their journey. They're on their journey. Amen. That is a hard thing for us to grasp because most of the church and most of those, the denominations have said, well, we set our flag and we're right and everybody else is wrong. Blah, 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 blah. And they blow their little trumpets. But see, that's not the living walk of the road to Emmaus. As Jesus, what Jesus do? He revealed himself through the scriptures to those two that were walking on the road and they went, what? And their hearts were on fire. Okay, my friend Brandon, if you'd read for me, please. I'm going to start Mark 11, 15 through 18. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. Oh. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be, a called, shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a robber's den. Ouch! The chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, for the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. Okay, now we're talking flipping tables. The religious perspective had blinded them. Jesus walks in. I'm going to walk you through this real slow. Oh, Shabbaha. And then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple area. Now I'm going to say, okay, I have some questions. What are you? You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're the temple of God. I'm going to show you, um, this is a prophetic overlay. If I don't know how, there's another, I'm sure there's a better description. But this is, there is literal looking at the story, and then there's the depth of what the spiritual reality that's behind it. So I want you to see this because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is within you. Papa is within you. Holy Spirit is within you because you can't separate the three. They're one. You are the temple. He's no longer in that place in Jerusalem. When Jesus died, what happened in the temple? What was ripped? The veil from top to bottom. Boom! Why? To reveal there was nothing in there. The ark was gone. There was no glory in there. It was just behind this curtain, so nobody knew any better. And everybody outside would go, oh yeah, God's behind the curtain. <laughs> curtain number one. Let's make a deal. I want you to... Yes, exactly. The Wizard of Oz. See, I want you to get this. Now, I'm going to use myself, but if it falls on you, get it. Inside of me was a veil that had been given to me through my belief system of being taught in denominations that this was how it was. And I went, oh, okay. And being trustworthy, 
you know, trusting folks. I came to that. Keith, go ahead. You got something? Yeah, go ahead. Come on up, grab the mic. Oh, push the button till it turns green. There you go. It's just not the church. It's the world as well. It is. Because we, we accept the world as it comes at us, mm -hmm. and we create our own false reality, and oh, we've yeah. talked about that before. Oh, but so, yes. so there's so much in our hearts mm -hmm. that's false. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That is very true. And we try to live out of that. Make sure she's turned off. So he entered the temple area and began to drive out those who were selling and buying on the temple grounds. Okay, there's the literal. Okay? How does that work inside of us? What is inside of us that doesn't belong there? Now, I want to tell you something. Just uh, I'll, I'll throw it in here early, and I'll go back to revisit it. Are Papa, Jesus, and Holy Spirit comfortable living inside of you now or even the very first day? Absolutely. With all of my sin, they're comfortable in there? Yes. Hmm, that's hard for some people to swallow because we've been told by religion and denominations that God cannot look upon sin. Wait a minute. That don't work. There's a whole lot of other branches that run off of that one, but I'm going to tell you, if he can't look at sin, he can't look at our, and even towards earth, if that's your belief system. Okay, I'm jumping back now. He went into that and started driving out those who were selling and buying on temple grounds. Your holy ground. Who is trafficking inside of your life? Who is trafficking inside your life? Is it a lie? Mm, little voices? Do you have a little demon over here and a little angel over here going, pss, 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 all that? No. That's a perception that has been given. It's Holy Spirit inside of you. What? Reminding you of everything Jesus said. And Papa can speak to you. And I've, I'll be honest with you. I've seen God speak through people that don't even believe in God. He can speak through, he can speak through some Balaam's ass. He can speak through anybody. Sorry if that offends you. No, I'm not sorry. If you get offended by that, get over it. Man, God made them. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. Flipping tables. In your life, you will have perspective adjustments. Paradigm shifts. Why? Because Jesus is alive and well inside of you. Pop and Holy Spirit are residing in you. You are the temple, and he's going to flip tables that are making, getting in the way of relationship with them. Oh, Patty's waving. Mm. Yeah, sure, throw it up there. I like that picture. I like this picture. Let's do the Jesus flipping tables. That's a cool picture. Yeah, look at that. Woohoo! Woo! Rip tearing. Now, for those that are are not offendable. You see down there in that bottom corner called Naked Pastor? This is a guy from Canada. He's really cool. He's older than me. White hair, big old long beard. But he has these most incredible drawings. But anyhow, this is his. And uh, he's cool. I, you know, I, I text him and interact with him. So I want you to see this. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats who are selling doves. I mean, not only do the tables, he's kicking their seats out from underneath them. You cannot rest in this house because of what you're doing. I'm going to kick your seat right out from underneath you. I'm going to turn over the tables because there's lies in the midst of you. Oh, but pastor, that's so uncomfortable when God starts messing with my stuff. Yep. He's messing with my stuff. Why? Because he loves the temple and he's making sure that you have full freedom and you're not blind so that you can see the kingdom. Like Nicodemus, you don't even recognize you're born from above. You're living literal here. You can't see the kingdom. You're blinded by your religious perspectives. I'm going to make sure those are got out of the way because, and we'll get there in a moment, and he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple grounds. He doesn't want you to be trafficked in. 
He doesn't want the enemy trafficking. He doesn't want a religious trafficking in you. He doesn't want all the lies being trafficked. Because you know, when they built the temple, there was no sound of a chisel or hammer. That was all done in the quarry. It was a place of peace and rest and beauty. And he wants that to be about you. This is the overlay I'm showing you. He wants you to realize that this is a beautiful, quiet place of rest for them and you to experience together. Ooh, glory. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. And verse 17 says, And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written? Mar yeah, Brandon, I'll have you read this part. Verse 17. He began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den. Whoa. The chief priests and scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, for the whole crowd was astonished at his, at his teaching. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Okay, I'm going to go through this. I'm going to do it slow. Mm, verse 17. And he began to teach. And say to them, see, this is where the very beginning of our conversation happens. He begins a conversation within us. It's like, hey, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? See, they're always speaking. Sometimes we're going, la, 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 not listening. Or sometimes we're so blind we can't see. Is it not written? This is, he's speaking and reminding us of a truth about us. Don't you realize you're the temple of Holy Spirit? Do you not know that you're a new creation? Old things have passed away. All things become new. See, this is the conversation. This is the living word that makes the written word alive. This is the matrix of where we are seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Far above, we're realizing and experiencing that we are born from above and experiencing and releasing kingdom here because we already see where we are and who we are in Christ and then the kingdom of God can be entered into. That's a whole other teaching and I'm, it's not time for that yet in this house. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Bam, stop right there. Bam, bam, bam. Yes. I want you to think about that being said in the midst of a Jewish community inside of the temple. For all nations. I'm going to step back. My house will be called a house of prayer. I'm going to stop right there. What does that mean? What is the house of prayer? Don't get religious on me. What is the house of prayer really talking about? Communion. Communion. Absolutely. They are residing inside of you. You are the temple. And what is prayer? It's not the stained glass window stuff. It's conversation. Oh God, thou art so holy. I need you tonight. No, it's like today sucks. And I'm really not happy. So I need a little joy of the Lord. That's just me. That's my paraphrase of how I pray. It's conversation. It's talking. I don't need stained glass windows to get to God. God's already inside the temple. It's the light of God. It's the joy. It's the goodness of God that brings me to what? Repentance, the metanoia. It's the changing of my mind. That metanoia word is so critical. So it begins with my house will be called a house of prayer. That means face-to-face -face relationship. He's not look. He's not like, I can't look at your face because you're so sinful. I can't stand your presence. You smell us like dead fish three days later. God doesn't do that. He is embracing us. You know what? He picked me up in all my poo, okay, and washed me and bathed me and spoke life into me and love and acceptance and changed how I saw myself. This temple he calls holy. Is it my flesh? No. It's my spirit. It's who I am in my essence. The flesh is just flesh. He makes it holy. If you go back and you realize when it says if something holy touched something unholy, what happened? It became holy. 
If it wrapped, was that wrapped in the priest's cloak, it became a holy thing. Okay? Stop looking at it. It's like, oh, I touched the world. I got to go run and take a bath and shower and, and get some comet and some lava soap and scrub myself. No, no, no. You're the holy element that transforms those around you. Man, thank God. He, and it's not like we're some tool in the toolbox. No, we are the sons and daughters of the Most High. All creation is looking for us to be revealed. And we can't be revealed when we got this old blind thing, religious spec, you know, perspective messing us up. Man, the world wants to see God's sons and daughters that are walking in freedom and sharing how to get free. I, I take bunny trails all over the place. So it's a place of face-to-face -face relationship for all nations. What does that mean? Every, all means all. Now you're, this is being dropped right in the midst of the temple where all the Jews are learning, like, and they didn't see anybody, but we are the chosen people. We are the best. Ain't no more than us. And Jesus is going, our house, my house will be played for a place of prayer for all nations. That should have been red flagged all over the place by the Jewish mindset. Wait a minute! All nations? No, there's us. There's them, and there's us. Boom, boom, boom. And we got a wall around the temple, and we're taking, you know, we're taking care of ourselves. Now I'll leave it at that. All nations means all nations. Does that mean like, like Germans and, you know, da 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 all, the, all the, the divisions you can think about? All means all. What about lifestyles? Ooh, Pastor Mike, you're getting too close to the edge. You're going to get burned. All means all. Palestinians. Palestinians. Oh. Nazis. Nazis. All of them. Even that, even our mindsets are so twisted up sometimes. I'll tell you, it's tough. And if I could be so bold, doesn't matter about what political party you're in. Oh, Pastor, you better shut up now because you're going to have us running from the building. If he loves them all, and this is supposed to be a place of, of relationship for all nations, that means all. So you know what? I'm not going to go any further there, but I'll let you do the dance with that one. But you have made it a den of robbers. Why? Why have, is that religious perspective of trading and lying about who we are made it a den of robbers? I'll talk to you in a second about that. Ah, it's identity. There you go. Good job. It's about identity. Control. And control, absolutely. See, that's what they were all about, control. And they were in bed with the political party of the time, the Romans. Ah, Pastor Mike, you better step away from that one. Verse 18. Yeah, go ahead and read verse 18 one more time. The chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, for the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. There you go. So who are the ones that want to throw him under the bus? That's right, the Pharisees, Sadducees, all those guys that were in control. The scribes, yeah. They were like, wait a minute, we're not allowed to talk about that stuff here. We've got this nailed. You can't say that here. Oh, man. You're, 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 and I'll tell you, that word nations is ethnos. Okay, this is Greek. If you're really into Greek, you want to study this out? It's, it's in the Strong's, under G for Greek, 1484. It means ethnos, and it means this, a race as of some habit. A tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish, and usually, get this one, because I want you to hear this, all nations in this particular word under G1484 means usually by implication a pagan. Ooh, Pastor Mike, you're saying the temple is to be a place for even the pagans to come? Oh, no. I will not kill and eat those things. I will not do that, Peter says. Those are unclean. God says, don't call anything unclean. I call clean. Oh, man, back the bus up. Oh, can you imagine? Oh, my gracious, glory to Jesus. He is so good. Even the pagans. <gasps> now, you know pagans 
You say that word now, it's like, pfft, doesn't make any sense. But you say a lifestyle or whatever thing you want to throw in there, the church is like, no! Ah! They do the little cross and run for the tall grass. The house of God is a place where everybody can meet face to face no matter what they are, what they label themselves, or what you themselves label them, just as Nina said. Oh, that hurts. But there's Jesus saying it right in the midst of them, and they didn't even catch on to what he was saying. They were just looking, they, they were so in, intense, assaulted and, ins, and insulted. Mm, 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 mm. A den of thieves and robbers. What happens there? Religious perspectives robs them of the truth of who they are. Oh, now, Patty, if you'd put up the two tables, I need, if you can. Oh, man, ow. Isn't that comfortable, Kirk? Yeah, if you could bring up my favorite picture, you know, of us around the table. <sighs> okay, now I'm going to start showing you the perspective that's deeper than just the literal on the surface. Okay? We know this one. This is my favorite picture. What is that showing? It's showing a table where we meet face to face with them and it's placed for us to sit and sup with them face to face. And they give of themselves and they give to each other and we give back. Okay? That is the essence of who we are and that's the relationship we talked about from the very beginning. And what happens is, now jump back to the one from the naked pastor with the drawing. This is our identity. That's the one that Jesus comes to throw because we have other things inside of us that we're believing that are robbing us from our identity. They're robbing us from the freedom of who we are. They're robbing us and bringing us into, instead of a free, open conversation, sitting at a table, supping with them, what happened there? The, the religious perspective, they trafficked. You have, and what's that? Penal substitution, is that the right word? You have to do this to be accepted at this table. You have to buy a dove and sacrifice it to be accepted by God because you're such a filthy sender. God's coming in there, Jesus is coming in and going, that is a lie. And I will not let that be trafficked within my temple. We have perspectives and beliefs about ourselves that, oh, I'm not worthy. Oh, you may not be worthy in your own understanding, but listen, because you're looking at it like Nicodemus on a literal relationship. Somebody you have to buy or barter with or buy into the kingdom, you can't see the kingdom because you're, you're looking at it through the eyes of, I have to do something to be accepted. Ouch. Jesus won't let that happen. He doesn't want you living from that reality. He doesn't want that, that religious perspective blinding to you to the, what's sitting right in front of you already. He wants to rip that curtain away. Is this good? Yes, yes Keith. We're so blind we can't hear. Yeah, we're, that's right. We're so blind we can't hear. It, makes sense, but it's true. it is very true. We speak a language they can't see. You heard me say that a couple weeks ago. He doesn't want us in that place. He's going to take that and flip the tables, flipping tables, so we can get these tables out of the way, so we can get back to the real one that we're sitting, that we have been seated with them to sit around a table. Mm. Somebody shout amen. amen. And I love this part. The, the, those that were in control, the priests and the scribes heard this and they began to seek how to put him to death. We can't have this. We can't have this kind of thinking. We can't have this kind of conversation because we got this and we're making money, honey. And we control these puppets, these sheep. We've got them right where we want them. They were afraid. You betcha God put the fear of them into them for a good reason. He wanted to transform their minds too because he was after them. He hadn't rejected the Pharisees and Sadducees and all them. He loved them all. He wanted to shake them loose from their religious perspectives that were blinding them. It's interesting. 
for they were afraid of him. Why? Because of all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Now, that's the story. That was laid out before. And as you've heard me say before, that the entire book of Acts is about the deconstruction or the perspective adjustment from the old to the new. Now, I want to t- I'm just going to throw this in here. Is it time to do that? No, I want to read, I want to read what John Master Giovanni said. I, put, I shared this with my friends down in California. And uh, it started some conversation, which, you know, that's what I do. I, I kind of stir the pot. And some questions came out. And uh, John Master Giovanni said this to one individual that had a question. First, there's a big difference between flipping tables and assaulting people. You know, the, 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 most of the denominations say he went in there and he made that whip. And he whipped them people. No, he didn't. That's not what he did. They have given you a narrative that goes with their divine perspective of what Jesus is about. John goes on. I'm sorry, I, I need to just stay on target with John here. And assaulting people. Second, in case of the Christ conflict here, is that people put on a table, in this case money changers, those who sold sacrificial items, is where the capitalization on people's misfortune or sin is capitalized on. How many books do you think these guys have written across the, the world to traffic their belief system, to make money, to give somebody, dun, dun, the kingdom of God's over here. If you buy my book, you'll get there in Jesus' name. Hence, Jesus wasn't assaulting the people. More narrowly, the person trying to capitalize on the benefit of another so-called moral failure. Ouch! I'll let you flesh that out on your own. You've all seen the books that makes millions of dollars that tell you how to get to the kingdom of God, which is already within you. So I'll step on my own toes there. But what they put on the table to capitalize on the moral sinful failure. You see, that's it. They, they traffic in this failure. You're a filthy sinner. You're a worm. You're not worth anything. But I'll sell you a book that tells you how to get cured. Yes, Keith? We don't have a good definition of sin. No, we don't have a good definition of sin. But I, we, we've, we, will, we are talking about that. All right? The table is a metaphor of how we think. Absolutely. This table here is the table of how we perceive or our perspective about what we've been told. And if it's contrary to what the truth of God of the round table with them sitting there giving us morsels from their lips, Jesus is going, can't have that. Kirk, you have something you want to say? It's what we feast on. It's what we feast on, exactly. We feast on that, that's poison. It'll twist up how you see life. So going on. Uh, Jesus overturning, uh, third, Jesus was overturning, challenging how we think and more so how that is in impairing our prayer life, how we perceive them. If we see them way over there and I'm not worthy and I got to get down here and grovel in the dirt to get near them, Jesus is going, I'm going to turn that table over. It's how we see ourselves. He's going to rip that and he's going to, not going to let that be trafficked in our life anymore because trafficked people, as Andy can tell us, is not a pleasant place to be because it is a house of prayer. It is face-to-face relationship. I hope you guys are getting this because how we pray is a result of how we think. I and mean, I used to feel that God was way over there and I'm just like, I want to hide because I'm like Adam and I want to have a little fig leaf. I was going for the whole flipping tree. And God says, you don't need the tree other than the tree of life that I've already grafted you into because I am the vine, or I am the branches, or I'm the vine, you're the branches. He's already grafted us in. How we pray reflects how we think. The notion that there were money changers selling sacrificial animals in the house of prayer was established how one perceives themselves as they approach God. Absolutely. If you believe you have to do something and buy something, that penal substitution, you know, oh Jesus, you go take a whooping for me because I, I just, I, you know, God, I want you to, I'm going to hide behind Jesus. I'm going to hide behind Jesus. When every time God looks at me, he's looking at Jesus. He can see through these wonderful lenses called Jesus. And when he looks at me, that's all, stop it. Talk about a perceptive, screwed up mess that was given to us by religion. Whoa, okay. 
Jesus was overturning the way of thinking in very real ways. It happens inside of us. Jesus called it a den of thieves. That wasn't about money directly, but religion robbing people of their value and worth. There it is. A den of thieves inside of us. There is something that robs us of our identity and of value. When God made everything in the beginning, he said, it's good. He made Adam, it's very good. When he sent Jesus, he was, the angels were proclaiming to the shepherds. He said, in whom I'm well pleased. What was going on? Man, the, the Romans were in Jerusalem. There was all kinds of garbage. But you know what? As mankind, he was well pleased. How does that compute to your religious thoughts going on? The scribes, uh, fourth, the result, the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. Jesus challenged the way we think, but didn't physically assault the person. While the religious who didn't like how someone Jesus taught, their solution was destroy the person. Jesus wasn't doing anything to the people. He was getting the cows and the, and the sheep and the doves. He's getting the animals out. And the guys that were selling them, they were running after their critters because there goes their money. Everything they had control of in value. It wasn't the people, it was the stuff they had. Valerie. Now it's commoditizing people. It is commoditizing people. Ouch! That's what... Uh, I don't, yeah, we're just, yeah, we're just a commodity. And that fits in all kinds of places right now in our world. And I'll leave it at that. They wanted to destroy the man because they didn't like the message he brought. Ooh, ow. Uh-huh. Exactly like all the other... And that was, John, that was John Master Giovanni's response. And this is, where, this is what I felt in my heart. <laughs> Get this. Who enters the kingdom of God before the Pharisees? It's found in Matthew 21. Patty, if you have that one, Matthew 21, 31. Yeah. And Brandon, if you could read that when she gets it up there for us. You don't have that one? Matthew 21, 31. I'm sorry. I might have just added that one. I was, I'm always on the fly. Matthew 21, 31. I think that's what it is. Um, dum, dum. Read it. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. Boom! Barry Bonds in the Bay in San Francisco home run. <laughs> now I'm showing my age here, but I saw it happen. Barry Bonds hit a ball so hard that it flew out of the, the park in San Francisco and landed in the Bay where the boats were. This is what Jesus just did right there. Oh my gosh, he smacked a beehive. The tax collectors and prostitutes get in there before me? Ah. Sure, because why? They were looking for real truth to set them free. You guys have a religious thing that's blinding you. Your perspective's messing you up. So let me set you free. And you remember a couple months back, I talked about being blind. And if you're blind, then God can make you see. The beauty of that. All right, and I want to tie this in to that whole thing about being a place of prayer for all nations, because God, again, through Holy Spirit, is speaking to the midst of something. Patty, do you have the Acts twenty-one twenty-eight? Maybe I did. Maybe this might be added too. I had so much flying this morning. I was up early. I was up at five. And... Okay, I'll let you. I'm sorry. I love you, honey. You love me too. Maybe. Okay, Acts 21, 28. I'll have you read this again, Brandon. You're doing a great job. Thank you. She knows I move, I fly like, like crazy. Here you go. Okay, now I'm going to set the stage. This is some time later after Jesus is dead and gone. This is, this is Paul. And I want to get a whole bunch of bunny trails off of here. But he comes down, he starts letting the truth out. Oh, Lord, have mercy, them Pharisees and Sadducees threw a fit like you had never seen. Now, there's the stage. Crying out, men of Israel, come to our aid. 
This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. I think Paul was doing exactly what Jesus said. This could be a house of prayer for all nations. Pop back to that first one, honey, because I'm going to flesh this out. I'm almost done. (laughs) Man of Israel! (laughs) I mean, mean, these guys were incensed. They were looking for a reason. I mean, they wanted to kill Jesus. They were looking for a way there. Oh, man, Paul's in here now. Paul had, he's a Pharisee of Pharisees, man. He knew how to, he knew the law. He was really good at what he did. And here he is, he's coming in town. He's coming into the double courts and he's really upsetting things. Man of Israel, come to our aid. Oh, their hair's on fire. They're screaming. They're, oh my gosh, there goes our religion, our control. You ever been around somebody that's so religiously dogmatic that they just have a fit when you open your mouth of freedom? This is the man. This guy right here, I am not happy with. Why? Because he preaches to all men. (gasps) I think Paul got something. All nations. All men. Everywhere. Everywhere this guy goes, he is preaching what? Against our people. (gasps) And the law. I mean, not just against us Jews. He's going against everything we believe. Where our whole society is based on the law. And this place, the temple. Oh, man, we're, talk, we're checking boxes here. We got him for this one. We got him for this one. We got him for this. And they're looking for a legal re- you know, reason to get rid of him. And he even, oh, even, you can feel them pushing out their chest and straightening their ropes brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Does that sound religious enough for you? That's the best I could do. Wow. Paul was fulfilling what Jesus said this place was for. A place of face-to-face relationship for all nations, whether they're pagans, whatever, whatever you label them for, this is the place. You're the temple. Now I'm going to share this God entrusts you with people's lives. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, Papa, and Holy Spirit live within you. He entrusts you with others' lives. What are you going to give them? A table with a bunch of stuff they have to buy? Or are you going to love you guys? Or are you going to give them freedom? Or are you going to tell them the truth? Do you see what I'm saying? This is the perspective adjustment. And I'll close with this. In their eyes, the temple was being defiled. In my life, <laughs> as I share my freedom in Christ, and they call me a heretic, that you have defiled who you are, the temple of the Holy Spirit, by because of what you believe, I go, I'm sorry that's how you feel. And if we break fellowship because of where I have my freedom and my face-to-face relationship with all three of them around this beautiful sub table that we inter- inter- interact with each other, if that offends you and you think that that's a heresy and you want to break fellowship, I love you. But this is where I live. And I came a long way to get here. And I dropped off a whole lot of stuff. And I turned up a lot of tables with Jesus. He threw one table over and all my stuff went flying. And as I suddenly start to see clearly that I have a whole bunch of other tables and chairs and and trafficking in my, my belief system, I'm going, I watch Jesus. He's having fun tipping my first table and watching my crap go flying. And I went, oh, ow! And then I look at this, he's giggling. I'm like, what are you laughing about? He says, you just got freedom. I'm like, okay. He th- okay, and I had to look at my heart. And I go, that was kind of nice, wasn't it? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, you're free, aren't you? Yeah. I used to think you were this way. He goes, I'm just turning your tables. I'm flipping your tables. And all that you thought you had to buy 
to get me and Papa and Holy Spirit in your life no longer has authority to lie to you and blind you to the truth. Ah, yeah. So you know what? I go, what about that table? That one's pretty strong. You know, I have a lot of religious scriptures that really line that up. He goes, you want me to show you how that one works? Uh, yeah, because that one's really strong. Will it hold against your hand? You flipping my table? He goes, let's do it together. See, he invites me to the flipping tables now. Because he says, you know the table I showed you? Patty, if you could bring up my favorite picture. Tell me when it's up there. Is it up there? Not yet. It's coming. Okay. He keeps reminding me, this is my table. And he's, they're, they're pointing. There's Holy Spirit on the right with the green pointing. There's your place. There's where you belong. You're already there. Okay. And I keep thinking, I've got this other table. I've got to get some inner child. You know, I've got to get the, the money changer. I've got to do my thing to get worthy. He's going, no. And then we both go over there. And I'm like, I, let's do this. And he, now this is really important. We've been told we have to yield to them. But what's really cool, in this picture, they're all interacting with each other. They allow each other to do their thing. The Father looks to the Son, the Father looks to the Father, and the Holy Spirit, the Father's looking at the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's pointing to us where we belong, and then they ask us. And we say, you know, we say, well, Jesus, you flip the table. No, they want us fully engaged in the flipping. Because when we get to that choice, and the first time, my second table, I went, let's flip it together, because I don't know if I can do this alone. And he goes, okay, flip it. Ooh, that felt good. And Jesus goes, this is just my paraphrase of my living inside the matrix of the living word. He says, what table do you want to do next? And then the conversation starts. What about this religious belief that I have to do da 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 And Jesus says, so, what do you want to do about that? I need, to, I need the truth of what's happening there because I've been indoctrinated with this other thing. He goes, okay. And he goes, by the way, you've heard it said, but I tell you. I went, oh, flipping my own tables now. I'm flipping my own tables because those things rob me. It has been a den of thieves robbing me of my true identity and living this place of freedom in Christ Jesus. Now I don't have to, I'm not blind. I can see the kingdom. And now I'm experiencing the kingdom because there's all this crud and money changers and tables that have been in my way from this place. I got to stop. I probably bombarded your brains. But I'm going to close with this statement. Okay, I've really said I was, but I'm, I'm here now. Okay, I'm holding on. This is the closing statement. Take a deep breath. Do you realize that Papa, Jesus, and Holy Spirit are quite content to have moved into your heart and make their home there in all our brokenness, sin consciousness, and poor choices? They are content to make residence there. Because they make all things new. And that includes you. <laughs> Why? Because we, were no, we died in Christ. We raised with Him. We're seated with Him. And we are new creations. All things, behold, all things have become new. Old has passed away. Well, Papa, you bombed us good today. I thank you for grace. I thank you for flipping tables. <laughs> and I, th I thank you that you know exactly where each and every one of us are. And you're about removing the blindness. You're about removing those things that rob us from that relationship of being seated, seated at a table face to face, not afraid to talk about any, anything 
because you already know our hearts, because you're alive and well and content to live in our brokenness, in our sin consciousness, in all the lies that we're stuck in. And you're all about picking us up and washing us one touch at a time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks. I hope I didn't blow you out of the water, but I want you to go back, listen to this again, and check.